Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our briefing today about protecting vulnerable communities from climate impacts. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Next slide, please. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change policies to policymakers. Over time, we've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. Next slide, please. Our session today is the second in a new series produced in collaboration between EESI and the Energy Efficiency for All Coalition. EFA unites people from diverse sectors and backgrounds to collectively make affordable multifamily homes energy and water efficient. The four national partners that comprise the coalition, Elevate Energy, the Energy Foundation, National Housing Trust, and the Natural Resources Defense Council support sustainability efforts across 12 states and bring together advocates and stakeholders to develop innovative and collective solutions to increase access to healthy and affordable homes. EFA is doing great work in many locations, and I encourage you to visit the coalition online at www.energyefficiencyforall.org to learn more. ESI is very proud of our partnership with EFA. It is a genuine privilege to work with EFA to share the good news of energy efficiency, multifamily housing, and affordability, healthy homes, and strong, resilient, and equitable communities. So thanks very much to our friends at EFA for helping us bring this briefing to you today. Back in February, we partnered with EFA to assemble a panel to discuss relief and housing assistance for communities impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. As a reminder at the outset, if you miss anything today, or if you would like to go back to the briefing from, uh, briefing from February to revisit the presentations, everything we produce is available online at www.eesi.org. And while you're there, I hope you'll take a moment to sign up for our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Today, we will consider the stresses and strains that climate impacts, like sea level rise, extreme precipitation, and dangerous heat waves and cold snaps put on already vulnerable affordable housing developments and our neighbors in low-income areas and communities of color, from Los Angeles to Miami and places in between. In our major report released last year, A Resilient Future for Coastal Communities, we highlighted mitigation and adaptation benefits in our recommendation to prioritize resilience when developing and preserving safe and affordable housing in pre-disaster preparations and post-disaster recovery. Policymakers, we said, could make investments in safe and affordable housing to improve community resilience, deploy cost-effective energy efficiency, renewable energy, and promote equity, three worthy goals of a comprehensive and sustainable approach to how we develop our surroundings. Many of our recommendations also focused on the need to develop new and refine existing climate risk assessment tools make data accessible to non-experts to facilitate inclusive community-based preparations and planning, and learn from successes from cities and states achieving their goals and delivering benefits to residents. These topics will also be addressed over the course of the next 90 minutes or so. And for policymakers online with us today, I hope you're taking notes because a great deal of this information will be informative as you start to assemble and consider proposals that address the nexus of climate and infrastructure and in these parts, during EESI online briefings, we definitely consider buildings in our working definition of infrastructure, and buildings definitely include affordable housing. Before I introduce our panelists, let me mention that we would be glad to take your questions today as we go through um, our session to inform our discussion. If you have a question, we have two options to ask it. First, you can send us a message on Twitter at EESI online, or you can send us an email to EESI at EESI.org. We'll do our best to incorporate your questions uh, during our Q&A after our fourth panelist. And now I get to introduce our first panelist. Dr. Benjamin Strauss serves as President, CEO, and Chief Scientist at Climate Central. He is an expert on sea level rise and the architect of the Surging Sea suite of maps, tools, and visualizations. Uh, Benjamin has testified before the United States Senate, and his research has been cited by the White House and two Secretaries General of the United Nations. His work has won extensive coverage in US and international media, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Associated Press, Reuters, Bloomberg, and other outlets in at least 110 countries and 29 languages. Benjamin, thank you so much for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. Dan, uh, thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure uh, and honor to be here uh, and talk about this important subject. Um, just a 
first, a very brief bit of background about Climate Central. We are an independent uh, nonprofit organization, uh, non-advocacy and nonpartisan, um, that researches, uh, reports, and visualizes compelling local information on climate change and what we can do about it everywhere. So I'd like to, uh, mindful of time, dive straight into the presentation. If we could get the first slide up. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a recent study, uh, a recent peer-reviewed research paper uh, that I co-authored with colleagues uh, from an University of California, the National Housing Trust, uh, and some colleagues at Climate Central, and uh, a related online tool and information resources that I hope will be uh, interesting to this group. So I'll start with a brief explanation of the um, methods and findings of the research, but then really um, dwell some more on a very quick tour of the tool and uh, how you can use it and what you can get from it because it dives down into the local information. Um, so uh, I think um, we might have skipped a slide there. The, um, the, the first, so that why, why do research on affordable housing per se and uh, coastal flood risk? First, um, well, really because there's a triple threat. Uh, affordable housing tends to be in substandard condition. So um, there's a question of the, vulner the physical vulnerability of um, the physical structures themselves. Second is the socioeconomic vulnerability of uh, their inhabitants. And third, of course, is that the environment is changing, sea level is rising, and that's increasing the frequency of coastal floods. Um, now, if we could move along to the next, that would be great. So um, in this study, uh, we used two large national databases of affordable housing. First, uh, we used, we included federally subsidized housing uh, compiled in a database uh, maintained by the National Housing Trust. That housing includes public housing, housing in HUD sections 8202 and 236, uh, USDA sections 515 and 538, uh, the IRS low-income housing tax credit program, some state programs, and a little bit more. Um, we also included natural occurring uh, affordable housing, in other words, unsubsidized housing, and that we define as housing with rents below local market rates, or at least 30% below local median household income, and that comes from the CoStar database of, of housing uh, nationally. Uh, so moving to the next slide, um, the considerations that we factored into our research included, we looked at different climate pollution levels, high emission scenarios uh, versus lower emission scenarios. We considered a, a range of possible sea level outcomes depending uh, on each pollution level because there's a range of possible outcomes. We analyzed a full spectrum of flood heights and likelihoods um, across decades. So the higher the flood, the less likely. And we integrated across you know, annual type floods all the way up through 100 year floods and more severe. We focused the analysis on several uh, different years, in particular 2050, although you'll see in the tool, we enable exploration of um, every decade from here to the end of the century uh, in terms of likely impacts. Um, and finally, a special feature of the research um, that was a nice advance from some of the past literature is that this is analysis grounded in individual building footprints. You can see at the right um, in green, the kind of machine learning detected uh, housing footprints from a project that uh, Microsoft did and made public. So we matched uh, housing, affordable housing in the database to individual building footprints. And we were able to do our assessment um, where there was exposure of any corner or part of a building to flooding uh, in our analysis. OK. Um, moving to the next slide. So um, 
moving to key findings, uh, the basic headline is the amount of exposure, uh, to, uh, the, the amount of um, affordable housing units expected to be exposed to flooding each year triples uh, by the middle of the century uh, as compared to we were uh, actually in the year 2000, but we're much closer to 2000 today than we are to 2050. That, and, and secondarily, that threat is quite concentrated. The largest numbers of units are in New Jersey, New York, and Massachusetts, although there are effects in every coastal state. And even within states, there's concentration. When we look at uh, the, the 20 most threatened cities uh, account for about 75% of the national exposure. So that to me is a silver lining of this study. It suggests that uh, targeted efforts to mitigate and reduce uh, this threat uh, could address uh, a large amount of the problem. So moving to the next slide, um, just a quick visual look um, at the state level risk. Uh, it may be a little hard to see, uh, the details aren't so important, except you see uh, the blue lines represent the number of units at threat in the year 2000 versus the orange lines in 2050. And you see the first three are New York, New Jersey, New York, and Massachusetts. But especially with sea level rise, there's very appreciable threats in Virginia, Florida, California, uh, Connecticut, and moving on. If we could go to the next slide. So now going down to the city level, again, you see most of the threat is concentrated in terms of the raw numbers of uh, structures and individual housing units within them that are threatened is concentrated in New York, uh, actually Atlantic City, New Jersey, a much smaller city, uh, Boston, and several other municipalities. But if you look at the orange line, uh, some communities have a much higher percentage of their existing affordable housing stock that's threatened. And that's something quite important uh, to bear in mind in, in considering the impact. Uh, moving next, please. So um, now I'm gonna to shift to talking about the resources available to explore these findings in much more detail, uh, um, if that's of interest to you. And all of these resources are available online through our website, our Sea Level Rise website uh, at Climate Central. Uh, coastal.climatecentral.org. And in addition, once you're there, you need to click on choose map and go to affordable housing. So the resources include the scientific paper we published itself, um, a layperson's report, a recorded webinar that will go into more depth um, than I'm able to today here, um, a map tool and dynamic fact sheets or PDFs that can be generated for uh, each state or county or, or and scenario. Um, next slide, please. So here's a look at one view of the tool. We're looking here um, at imagery, uh, at the different threat level to counties in New Jersey uh, in the year 2050. And next slide. And if you were to mouse over uh, one of those counties, you could see of the, the quantitative result for that scenario. Next slide, please. Um, now, there are a lot of parameters you can adjust, uh, including what years forecast. Um, next slide. And next slide. And then moving to the next slide. Um, you can also change where we're looking. Next slide. Choose any state uh, in the country. Next. Um, once you're in a state, you can next. Choose to look at a lot of different geographic units. So we've been viewing impacts organized by a county in New Jersey, but we could look by congressional district or state legislative districts or for individual cities or even zip codes. Uh, next. Um, there's a range of other settings um, that you can use. Next. 
So change the pollution scenario, for instance, or look at all affordable housing above it versus subsidized housing only. Um, and then um, you know, choose, choose how lucky we get or don't get in terms of how sensitive sea level is, uh, uh, temperatures and sea level are uh, with respect to the pollution scenario. Uh, next. And next. Jumping around, here's a look at a map for Massachusetts by congressional district. And next. Here's a look at exposure within zip codes inside Atlantic County, New Jersey. Uh, and next, here's a look at counties in Florida. Um, but next, um, it's very the, important to notice this download button on the upper right, uh, next. And that is a pathway to a lot of additional resources, including a, a fact sheet which is dynamically tailored and customized to the particular um, view you've established, right? What state you're looking at, or it could be a county or a congressional district. Um, uh, also, uh, what's, what year you've chosen, uh, and even what pollution scenario you've chosen, all of that gets customized in the fact sheet if you download the fact sheet. I'll also point out, you can take a snapshot of the map, you can download you know, if you don't want to click on each county or location to get the number behind it, uh, you can download tables of data uh, below the CSV data button. Um, so for the, the wonks out there, that's the efficient way to get um, lots of data here. Um, but moving to the next slide, uh, this is an example of the fact sheet that you can generate uh, in, in around 10 seconds. And then uh, this is for Florida, 2050 counties. But moving to the next slide, here's Florida in 2070 looking at congressional districts. And moving to the next slide, that's the same fact sheet except in Spanish. The entire tool is available in Spanish as well as in English and all of the associated documentation and resources. Uh, next. Uh, finally, to wrap up, I just want to note that um, you can come back here to the base location and move over to Choose Map, Next, and you can get access to a wide range of other maps outside of the affordable housing sphere um, that are available on the site. Um, and I want to highlight in particular um, the, the year map um, moving mm -hmm. next because that allows you to pull up, uh, those of you who think of sea level rise maps, um, probably imagine something like this, where areas are shaded if they're literally going to be below water, as opposed to color coding a zip code or a county um, relative to um, you know, how many people or buildings might be exposed. This is, these maps are the underlying maps that show the geography of what areas specifically um, are at risk of flooding in the different scenarios that we've analyzed. And you can match up those scenarios. The same settings, um, or most of the same settings, are in this map, as you could find uh, in the affordable housing uh, module that I just showed you. Um, so uh, next, here again is the URL. Uh, I thank you for your attention and look forward to the Q&A, which will be at the end of the whole session. That's great, Benjamin. Thank you so much. And the Q&A will, in fact, like he said, be at the end. But I have a clarification from our online audience. Um, does the tool include all 50 states and US territories? Uh, it includes um, all 25 coastal states and Washington, DC. Uh, it does not, uh, well, the affordable housing part of it does not include territories. The uh, sea level rise layers and maps are, in fact, global. Great. Thanks. And in that yeah. number of coastal states, Hawaii would be one of those. Hawaii would be one of those, yes. Great. OK. Yeah, we had a question wanting to make sure that Hawaii was covered. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, it was a great presentation and an excellent way to kick off our panel today. Um, just wanted to remind our audience 
um, that if you missed anything or if you want to go back and you want to dig into Benjamin's presentation, everything is going to be posted a little later at www.esi.org, or you can go right to the source, www.climatecentral.org, and check it out there. Um, that was a really interesting overview of a really impressive tool. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move through our program, and I get to introduce our um, second speaker today. At the very beginning of the program, I mentioned our Coastal Resilience Report, uh, and our next panelist was actually one of our panelists during our Coastal Resilience Briefing Series, and so we get to welcome her back today uh, to talk about this topic. Um, Lori Schumann is the National Senior Program Director for Resilience and das Disaster Recovery Initiatives with Enterprise Community Partners. She oversees enterprises' internal and external efforts to preserve and protect affordable housing across the nation from the risks and impacts of natural hazards and changing climate. She has launched programs and initiatives to support uh, and help reduce the risk to housing and communities in Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, Texas, New York, California, and Florida. And she was one of our speakers during our Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands series last June. So, Lori, it is great to see you again. Thanks so much for joining us on today's panel. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Dan, and it's great to be a regular on the EESI community uh, <laughs> webinar. I, I couldn't be that bad. You invited me back, so <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to be with everyone today, and we've got a very timely topic that we're discussing, uh, given all of the discussion as of late around infrastructure, uh, resiliency, around equity, around the need for supporting communities on the front line. There's no more important and critical intersection, I believe, than the intersection between housing affordability, housing resiliency, and climate change. So I'd like to walk you through a little bit about what Enterprise does and some of the solutions we put forward to support affordable housing from a changing climate. Uh, we are very much you know, in the first generation of thinkers, um, all of you in the audience around this topic. So. Uh, you know, we're in many cases building the plane as we're flying it, uh, but we do know what the best practices are and we can find the solutions to the challenges of our day um, if we keep, keep collaborating and keep um, uh, taking risks and thinking about solutions. So next slide, please. Enterprise Community Partners has been in, uh, is a nonprofit. We've been uh, working to create opportunity for communities uh, low and moderate income communities around the nation for 40 plus years. Uh, we have 11 markets across the country. Uh, each of our markets responds to local challenges that are uh, facing communities uh, at the local level and also drives forward our mission to create opportunity for uh, households across the nation. And one of the important and critical features we've found over the years is in our efforts to preserve affordable housing, uh, we also know that there is a significant risk that's facing our communities, and that risk is uh, the risk of climate change, of, of rising sea levels, of extreme heat um, that compounds and aggravates uh, the shortage of affordable housing, that compounds and aggravates the risks that communities are facing, uh, and compounds and aggravates the inequities and systemic and structural uh, uh, inequities that our communities face. Um, our partners, next slide please, include every uh, sector from the federal, state, local, public sector partners to communities um, on the ground working day and night to build solutions and to deal with problems and critical challenges. Uh, we work with cities, we work with rural communities, we work with tribes uh, to uh, collectively solve the problems of our day. And so this is important that we have these um, various sectors of partners because we can't do it alone. I mean, what, not one sector can solve the problem alone. We have to have multiple sector solutions um, and cross cross uh, jurisdictional um, implementation efforts. Next slide, please. And so, as we all know from this year, the COVID pandemic has laid bare um, the many inequities that so many communities face. Um, many of us are on the internet today on Wi-Fi connection, uh, engaging each other on this platform. There are so many communities that don't have internet access. Um, there are communities that have really been struggling and will continue to struggle through the pandemic. 
um, the conditions that many communities that we serve face, particularly communities of color, frontline communities, communities that experience first and worst consequences of climate change. Um, these are communities that we are putting at the forefront of needing to serve. Um, we know that structural inequities, policies such as redlining have created um, uh, deficiencies in infrastructure that create incredible vulnerability. Um, and we also know that you know, decades of disinvestment have led to extreme exposure and risk for so many communities. So whether it's a fire or an earthquake, a flood or a pandemic, um, you know, not every community is, uh, shows up to face this reality in the same way. Not every community is impacted in the same way. Next slide. Please. Here's the biggest, one of the biggest issues that we're facing uh, at Enterprise and, and many of you in the audience that run cities and states face on a regular basis is the extreme shortage of affordable housing that our nation faces. Um, ten, near, nearly 11 million of the nation, 44 million renters have extremely low incomes. Um, the U.S. has a national shortage, according to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, uh, who produced this map. The U.S. has a national shortage of close to 8 million affordable housing uh, units, rental units. Um, at least uh, the most severe shortages, however, are in our cities, uh, leading with Las Vegas, then Houston, and Los Angeles. And these are the cities that face incredible, incredible um, affordable housing shortage where more than um, 40, 50 percent of a person's household income is going towards, towards rent or mortgage. Um, you'll also notice an interesting trend. If you look at the uh, darker areas of the map, these are the areas with the most housing shortage, affordable housing shortage. These are also areas that are extremely vulnerable to coastal flooding, hurricanes, extreme heat, earthquakes and fire. And so we see a very strong connection between affordable housing shortage and extreme climate risk, which puts these communities at extreme, extremely dangerous conditions. Because if we get a house and unit displaced from one of these natural hazards, it's very difficult to build it back. Next slide. More than 30 fourths of the nation's housing stock, whether it's affordable or not affordable, is at risk from fires, earthquakes, and floods. All you have to do is look at the risk maps of the United States. Fire zones, earthquake zones, flood zones. All told, Climate change has become one of the signifying challenges of our day, and our administration recognizes it. And there's a reason for it, because Americans are vulnerable to climate change. It's impacting everyone. We also know just one of many stats that 400,000 federally subsidized homes in the, are in the floodplain. So, you know, this is a big challenge for us, and it's just uh, an important issue that we're taking forward in the infrastructure bill and, and the administration and policies that we're, we're trying to develop. Next slide. And so what are the impacts to communities when we lose affordable housing? Um, we lose uh, affordable housing, it leads to displacement of households, uh, impact to workforce and economy, lowered property values. Uh, it impacts the entire community and the legacy is uh, long lived. Next slide, please. So after an event, we Enterprise has worked uh, tirelessly to create tools and programs to support communities in need. Um, the majority of our work, we hope, will really help communities before the event takes place because we know how expensive it is once an event happens and affordable housing is lost. Next slide. Tools that we've created deal with multifamily housing risk and what kind of resiliency strategies can we put forward to mitigate and adapt housing to changing conditions? tools that have been created with community, with the folks that are going to be moving these uh, tools forward. We believe that it's important to have participatory planning effort on every tool that's deployed. Next slide. And that these tools can go into shaping real housing in real ways. And this is a slide uh, of a newly constructed public housing facility in Freeport, Long Island called Moxby Rigby. We took the tools we developed and worked closely with the New York State Governor's Office of Storm Recovery and put forward ideas to create a new public housing facility that, would, that is resilient, state of the art, and will be able to survive for generations. Um, this is a floodplain community, 
And so we took an old facility and turned it into a resilient one, which again, will house the most vulnerable um, folks in Freeport, Long Island. This is a best practice. Next slide. And other ways we've adapted our tools is we took some of our uh, work to Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria and worked in concert with the University of Puerto Rico and hundreds of leaders across Puerto Rico and the states to develop a guide for what single family housing could be if it's resilient and informed from the ground. We believe in tools that are informed from the baseline, from the, from the ground, so that they're viable and feasible. Next slide. And this, this tool is really wonderful because it actually takes us through the entire sequence of how you build a home to be resilient, starting with the identification of risk, then moving to your site, and moving through to your bones and the uh, fabric of your building and the layering of the energy and the water systems uh, and trying then to look at operating the building. Then how do we pay for it and how do we uh, get it built to code? So this particular book has also been digitized and this is a really great way for us to support you in the audience, jurisdictions, states and cities to build a thoughtful a resilient housing program that'll help deal with your issues of the day. Next slide. And we took it, we've taken the in, interest in Keep Safe Housing further, and we've now got a program that we stood up with the city of Miami, Miami Dade, Miami Beach, called Keep Safe Miami. And we're working in concert with the city and over 70 community groups across Miami, Miami Dade, to help multifamily housing in Miami, Miami Dade, Miami Beach identify risk to climate and create solutions. Uh, we have set up funding sources with the city to help pay for the retrofitting of the multifamily housing sector. This is the kind of model program that we can put forward in many cities across the country to build and design and operate and deploy affordable housing that's resilient. Because we know in Miami and in many other areas that depend on tourism, that if we don't have affordable housing ready to uh, in the community that needs workforce housing, then we won't have an economy. We won't have a tourist industry. We need to make sure that folks don't have to travel two hours to get to their home uh, to get to work. Next slide. And other tools we're developing with Fannie Mae to provide free uh, you know, support for business continuity development for affordable housing operators. Next slide. So after all the lessons have been learned, after all of the work we've done in this field for over 15 years, we've got some best practices and some lessons learned I wanna share with you as I close. Um, we believe that there are actions we need to take to ensure that housing is built in a resilient way. We need funding, funding to support pre-disaster mitigation and adaptation. Uh, we can't continue to rebuild and rebuild and rebuild after every event, we need to build forward and ensure that our housing has the, has the funding to build uh, resilient and adaptive funding. Number two, we need to have technical assistance to help housing owners identify their risks, find solutions, and build the capacity to respond. We need stronger infrastructure, infrastructure that includes housing, infrastructure that's stable, that's secure, a grid that is going to be consistently delivering wastewater uh, treatment, water, potable water, and energy, most of all. And then finally, we need to have support for planning that's participatory, that puts equity at the forefront, and that shares models of best practice from around the nation, and in fact, around the world, because we are a global community with global solutions. Thank you so much for today, and I look forward to a robust discussion. Thanks, Lori. That was a great presentation, and I look forward to that dis uh, discussion a little bit later today, too. Um, as a reminder, uh, before I introduce our next panelist, if you have questions for us, and I've already asked one from the audience, um, when we get to that Q&A, if you have questions, you can follow us on Twitter at EESI Online. Um, alternatively, you can send us an email, and the email address to use is EESI at EESI.org. You can ask questions about um, any of the topics we're covering today. We'll, be, we'll do our best to get them. And now I get to introduce uh, Anna Weber. Uh, Anna is a senior policy analyst on the at the Natural Resources Defense Council on their water and climate team. 
Anna researches and advocates for policies that advance equitable adaptation to climate change. Her team works to incorporate the current and future effects of flooding, sea level rise, and other climate-driven hazards into local, state, and national decision-making and ensure that adaptation policies benefit those on the front lines of climate change. Prior to joining NRDC, uh, Anna spent 10 years at the Cadmus Group, where she supported uh, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, with respect to water quality. Uh, welcome to our panel today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm so glad to be here today. Um, great, thanks. So as you may know, the Natural Resources Defense Council is an international environmental nonprofit that works to safeguard the earth, including its people, its plants and animals, and the natural systems on which all life depends. Before I dive into my presentation, um, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the, the pain that I know so many communities are feeling right now, and that in the face of such ongoing heartbreak that talking about things like building codes and flood insurance just doesn't necessarily seem all that urgent. So I think we should take a moment just to acknowledge that if we're talking about protecting vulnerable communities, that the stuff that we're talking about here today is, is only one component of that protection and that safety. And, um, and I do very much support and, and appreciate everyone um, who took the time today to tune in despite everything that's going on. Um, all right, if you wanna to go to the first slide. Um, so we've heard a little bit about how um, there's this enormous risk that climate change poses to affordable housing and the need to invest in protections for communities that are both disproportionately exposed to physical risk from climate hazards. And also in the context of investments um, in, in the systems and policies that are designed to, to keep people safe. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about some of the ways that we can ensure that when we make these investments, um, we make them in ways that will last despite the threat of climate change. So to start, let's talk a little bit about this Washington Post article from a few days ago. It's about something called Atlas 14, which is one of these sort of extremely niche technical policy areas that most of us have never heard of, um, but it guides countless decisions across levels of government that have actually a huge effect on people's safety and quality of life. So if we go to the next slide, here's a quote from the article. Alice 14 is basically guidelines on how much rain to expect in different places so that if you're designing something, you can do it appropriately for the conditions that you will experience, you know, whether you're in Philadelphia or, or Phoenix. Um, next slide, please. The problem, though, is the same problem that flows through so many of our policies. It's that these guidelines are based only on past conditions. And that has made sense historically, but climate change means that using backward looking standards sets us up for failure before we've ever even put a shovel in the ground. Next slide, please. Basically, it's like we're driving down the road, but we're only looking in the rear view mirror. And that can be okay, as long as the road ahead is clear and it's the same as the road behind us. But climate change means that that is not the case. Next slide, please. Let's take flood zones, for example. Uh, so you probably know that FEMA's flood maps, which underlie the National Flood Insurance Program and the floodplain management requirements that come along with it are based on um, you know, site-specific data, but they're historical data. And climate change means that in many areas, more and more homes are flooding in areas that according to these maps are supposed to be at lower risk and therefore aren't as high on the list for flood risk, flood risk reduction projects. And in this article here it describes how in Houston, as in many cities, these neighborhoods that are outside the designated flood zone but experiencing more and more flooding are mostly black and Hispanic neighborhoods. They're getting hit with the impacts of climate change and the policies that are supposed to protect people aren't keeping up. Next slide, please. So I'm going to be mentioning a lot of different types of policy opportunities today. I don't wanna to dwell too much on the details of any of them, although I'm happy to answer any specific questions either today in the discussion 
or offline, or you can go to our website at nrdc.org to find um, a lot of information on all of these. Um, so there are, there's a, a variety of things that we can do to incorporate climate-based decision-making, forward-looking data and projections into the decisions that are made across all of our agencies and level of government. Um, th there are these just, there are relatively straightforward, tangible changes that we can be making to ensure that decisions that we make today account for changing conditions and correctly identify and protect those that are most at risk. So for example, creating flood maps that not only represent past risk, but also show future conditions, or incorporating additional protections into codes and standards for buildings that we're gonna be constructing at the coast. Next slide, please. Now, of course, having good data only goes so far. You have to know what it is, and it has to be communicated effectively. People, I'm sure you agree, have should have the right to know their own home's flood history and flood risk. But that is rarely the case, and that is especially rare with tenants. Um, in most states, there are simply no requirements um, or very poor requirements for anyone to tell you that a home that you're thinking of moving into has flooded before or is at risk of flooding in the future. Uh, and that requirements that do exist mostly apply to real estate transactions. So if you are deciding whether or not to rent a home in a particular neighborhood, you're pretty much out of luck. Even worse, this leads to situations where there are families who get turned down for disaster aid because a previous flood that they had no idea ever even happened meant that the property that they live in is required to hold flood insurance going forward, and they had no idea. Next slide, please. So we end up in situations like Scott Harris and his family did in Baltimore. Um, Scott told NPR last year that, quote, we had no idea at all that there was even a concern about a floodplain uh, until, that is, his home was hit by a flash flood. So the NPR story linked here goes on to say that, in fact, Scott's block had flooded at least six times since the 1970s, but that was before he moved in, and there was no way for him to know about that previous flooding. His home isn't in the FEMA-designated floodplain, and it's mostly at risk from urban flooding, basically stormwater runoff. So it's not like there's even a nearby body of water that provides any clues to his risk. Next slide, please. So again, in this case too, there are straightforward, tangible things that we can do to make sure nobody else is in this position. And some states are taking action on this. Texas, for example, just adopted a pretty comprehensive set of flood disclosure requirements in the past couple of years. But that's not the case in much of the country where people are covered by a sort of patchwork of uh, laws and regulations. Um, however, there are changes that can be made at the state level as well as at the federal level. For example, in the National Flood Insurance Program to guarantee homeowners, renters, and the general public a right to know about flood risks in their homes and communities. Next slide, please. So the last policy area I want to mention is pre-disaster hazard mitigation. And Lori talked about this a little bit. It just means taking action to address risk before something bad happens, which, you know, when you put it like that, is a no-brainer, right, in terms of saving lives and money and preventing suffering. But it's tough because the way our financial system works, you can't pay for things with avoided costs. They're not, it's not real money yet, right? Um, so communities, especially those who aren't in a position to take on debt, often rely on government grants to do this work, which is fine, except those grants aren't nearly enough and they are not set up to meet the needs of the communities that need them the most. Next slide. Basically, these grants are just hard to get. Um, and as a result, assistance often goes to places that have the pre-existing resources and capacity to get the money. These are local jurisdictions that have dedicated staff and grant writers and lawyers and engineers and experienced managing federally funded projects. So unsurprisingly, hazard mitigation dollars tend to flow to whiter, wealthier, and more populous communities, which sets them up to fare better when they're ultimately faced with hazards. And that then contributes toward the fact that disasters, when they hit, actually widen existing wealth gaps, making white families on balance wealthier 
after a disaster while leaving Black families even farther behind. Next slide, please. So these here are just a selection of the many changes that would help make hazard mitigation more accessible, more individually tailored to the needs of particular places, and basically allow, more com allow communities to have more agency over how they want to address climate risks. We need to grow the pool of money that's available for hazard mitigation, make it specifically available to the communities that are most in need, and accompany it with technical assistance and capacity building support so that communities have the ability not just to get the grants, but also to implement them and to plan well when they're using the money. Um, and I, I should note with all of the policy opportunities that I'm, I'm talking about here today, none of them are meant to exclude any of the others. And, and of course, this isn't an exhaustive list. So we need to be doing all of these things and more and we need to be doing them in a way that's responsive to the needs and desires of the communities that are already every day dealing with the threat multiplier of climate change on top of the structural inequalities and, and other harms to health, security, and well-being. Next slide. So to wrap up, I just want to leave you with this line from the recently announced infrastructure package. Uh, this was the most exciting line to me in the announcement. It says, Every dollar spent on rebuilding our infrastructure will be used to prevent, reduce, and withstand the impacts of the climate crisis. Now, the way I see it, this doesn't have to mean that every single dollar literally goes toward a clean energy project or toward hardening infrastructure against hurricanes, for example. It means that when we as a nation spend money, we should be doing it in a way that considers the predicted conditions over the life of whatever it is we're building. Um, it means making development and land use decisions that we're not going to regret in a couple of decades because a bridge is too low or because the train tracks are underwater or because the housing is inaccessible when it rains. Um, it means protecting the most vulnerable communities today and also addressing those vulnerabilities going forward so that risks are lower in the future. Uh, so in closing, I hope this presentation provides some food for thought in how we can start to achieve some of those goals. Thank you. Thanks for an excellent presentation. Um, and I feel like we should probably start recognizing panelists who are able to work in um, obscure federal programs or federal initiatives that have disproportionately impactful, uh, um, um, that are disproportionately impactful on our ability to withstand climate change. And Atlas 14 so far, I think, is the, the front runner. So maybe Heather, our next panelist, can top that. But um, I'm glad that you were able to work that in because it's one of those things that's kind of behind the scenes, but it's critically important and also fundamentally flawed, like you pointed out. So thank you so much for an excellent presentation. And now I get to introduce our fourth panelist, uh, and uh, this is Heather Rosenberg. Heather is an associate principal at Arup and um, is their city resilience skills leader in the Americas. She's an ecologist by training. Heather is a U.S. GBC Ginsburg Fellow with 20 years of experience in sustainability and resilience in the built environment. Her approach combines organizational and community resilience with effective asset management. Previously, uh, Heather was the founder and president of her own successful resilience strategy firm, Building Resilience Network. She created the Building Resilience LA program, worked with GRESB to develop its resilience module, and serves as resilience advisor to enterprise community partners. Um, it's almost afternoon for you, so I'll still say good morning to you, Heather. Uh, thank you so much for joining our panel today, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for, for including me today. It's really great to be here with all of you and be having this really critical discussion. Um, you know, sometimes we see uh, a lot of discussion around climate solutions that are disconnected from what people are experiencing on the ground. And, and all of the speakers today, I think, are, are pointing to uh, where we need to focus efforts on the most vulnerable populations and uh, make every strategy that we implement solve as many problems as we can we have their problems are too big to solve them one at a time we need to bring these things together 
Um, so that's what I'm going to share with you today a little bit about some work I've been doing actually in partnership with NRDC and Enterprise uh, and really trying to, to bring together some of these very um, challenging issues into more of an ecosystem approach. And we're really looking in, in these cases particularly at uh, making essentially a business case for investment in resilience retrofits of existing affordable housing is sort of the larger theme of the body of research that we're moving forward. If you think of money like water, it likes to flow downhill. It likes to find well-worn paths and, and keep going in the same grooves and get downhill as fast as possible. And in that context, existing affordable housing where there's no point of sale or, or other thing going on, that's like the top of the mountain. And it's been traditionally very hard to get resources where they are needed most. And that is why we need new approaches, new ways of framing the problems, new ways of quantifying the impacts and the benefits, and new ways of deploying really uh, comprehensive and systemic solutions. So next slide, please. For, for vulnerable communities, even the solutions that we implement can be the problem. Uh, part of that is related to, um, you know, the the challenge that, that Anna mentioned of communities that have um, more capacity or are more likely to and more able to to gather those resources. Um, but some of it just comes from the fact that when we think about solutions, we might think we're going to develop a policy for the city of, in this case, Los Angeles, uh, it's where I live. Um, we have all kinds of hazards here. We've got them all, um, you know, fire, flood, brimstone, you name it. Um, and we think a lot at the city level or at the regional level of how to address that. But if we don't bring it down to the household level to, and not even to the building level, but to the unit level, to the household, to the renters, um, to the owners of the rental property, as well as the residents, um, we will miss the mark. And, and in particular, we find that multifamily housing is really left out of a lot of policy, multifamily rental and particularly affordable. This is really the tippy top of the mountain for a lot of, um, for a lot of funding programs because you have a split incentive between uh, renters and landlords, because you have, um, um, you know, people who, who don't have operational control uh, of their units. And so there's, there's a lot of challenges here. And of course, the consequence of, of tipping the scales of the cost, uh, particularly towards uh, low-income renters, um, is displacement. And we already have a homelessness crisis and these other things. And so we have to design our policies to support low-income multifamily housing and, and really low-income housing in general um, with displacement as the thing we're trying to um, stay aware of and, and really focus on. Next slide. So looking at just one example, and we've done similar exercises. I'm going to talk about electrification today, which um, and decarbonization and electrification are actually, we think of those as uh, climate adaptation or climate mitigation strategies, right? That's not adaptation, that's GHG reduction. So why am I talking about it here? And I would argue that that can actually be seen, uh, electrification and, uh, and decarbonization are really critical goals. California has very um, aggressive targets and we're moving on this path in an aggressive um, and comprehensive way to decarbonize the grid, to electrify buildings, um, and, and that means, and will eventually mean, a massive retrofits of a lot of existing buildings. And, and we typically think about that in terms of, well, what is the first cost? What are the operational costs or savings in terms of energy savings? And how many GHGs uh, are we reducing? Um, which is great, and we need to keep thinking about all of that. But next slide. For, for low-income communities and multifamily housing and renters, that's happening in this much broader ecosystem of many different challenges. So in the resilience world, we often talk about shocks and stressors. We need to understand the stressors, not just when we're understanding what are the shocks that can happen, but what are the implications of different interventions and improvements that we can make. And when we think about something like electrifying existing buildings, for example, um, in the, the city of Los Angeles is considering and, and NRDC is, is looking and supporting 
um, what would an, uh, an ordinance or a measure look like to, to decarbonize existing buildings? Um, we have to understand the, the real situation on the ground for households where uh, many, uh, many households are extremely rent burdened. Uh, they're also energy burdened and utility burdened. And all of this is increasing as a result of COVID. Uh, these are communities that have been uh, disproportionately impacted by COVID. And from an, an employment perspective, from a healthcare perspective, um, from an economic perspective. And so communities are in crisis. When we start talking about electrification of affordable housing right now, the first thing we need to think about is we have communities in crisis. The number of people who are extremely rent burdened, the amount of rent arrears uh, that we are looking at for just from COVID is, is profound. Um, we also know that we're shifting labor force as we move from, from um, electricity to natural gas. We, um, we have all kinds of changes. And also we have changes that are happening at the grid level. California is uh, experiencing annual fires that disrupt uh, either because of damage directly to grid infrastructure or the potential uh, disruption to infrastructure from fires. Uh, we are seeing massive power outages. And we have to understand that those power outages can also have severe impacts on, uh, on low-income communities and particularly on medically uh, vulnerable populations who depend on energy for um, life-supporting equipment and all sorts of things like that. So these things are all uh, deeply interrelated. And when we start to say, well, how are we going to transition our energy infrastructure, our energy system, to support or to reduce greenhouse gases. We need to make sure that we're not creating unintended consequences and exacerbating these underlying stressors, but instead can we design our policies in a way that picks those things up, brings them together and puts them into a comprehensive uh, package. And so that's, that's what we're, we're looking at here is understanding the underlying stressors that the community is addressing um, and, and trying to build policy that, that solves all our problems at once. Um, next slide. So what does that look like? That's probably um, kind of small there, but, but this is an exercise we're doing not just with electrification, but we're looking at it with seismic retrofits. We're looking at with other sorts of potential retrofits that might need to be done. So we have competing goals here, right? We need to, number one, protect existing affordable housing, keep people in their homes and avoid displacement, protect the energy grid, uh, and energy reliability for everybody and move away from carbon emissions. So if we start with pretend, preventing displacement as our goal, we can look at, well, what are the things that are going to trigger displacement? We have both uh, economic drivers of displacement in terms of, uh, you know, uh, COVID-related rent burdens and just general rent burdens uh, in a place where we already have a housing shortage uh, and a housing crisis. So those things are happening on their own. At the same time, we have potential impacts of climate change and uh, other challenges. And here we have earthquakes too, things that will um, uh, potentially make those uh, housing units unfit for purpose. So we need to do both. We can't just say, well, we're gonna preserve existing housing and not touch it. We have to touch it to, to keep it fit for purpose because there is no alternative. Um, so if we look at electrification actually as a potential disruption, it is both a mitigation strategy uh, and a potential source of disruption. We can build better policies. So first of all, we have to understand how much does it actually cost? What are the first costs of retrofitting a building for electrification? How, how it cannot be mitigated um, in, in different ways? What are the operating costs? Does this increase energy costs or decrease it? And actually the answer here is it depends. And it depends a lot on how old that building is. Um, and then what are the benefits? And we're not necessarily always calculating all of the benefits. Um, there are benefits in terms of improved air quality. There are benefits that are health benefits up this, up this chain, and as well as benefits of avoiding displacement and keeping people in their homes, all of which has a societal benefit. And long-term, a cost savings, 
although as Anna was saying, it's really hard to get people to pay for avoided costs because there's no real money there. So thinking about what is the societal benefit, what is the, what, what are the agencies even that can be benefiting from these things? It can be health departments, it can be um, even the prison system, keeping people out of jail because we keep them in a home and, and not getting into other kinds of cycles. Can we quantify those things and at the same time quantify really understanding the first costs and, and design appropriate incentive programs and uh, packages of subsidies that, that are more targeted at the populations that we're talking about here. Um, which are quite, and, and I say populations as if it's one thing, it's an extremely diverse group of people and group of buildings and typologies and all sorts of other things. But there's, uh, there, there are some commonalities that we need to design for. Next slide. So ultimately, when we think about um, energy resilience, electrification and decarbonization are one piece of a much broader in ecosystem that involves changes that need to happen at the grid, changes that need to happen at the building, and that interface in between. And as we understand these different dimensions, can we design programs that meet all of these different goals at once? That, first of all, prevent displacement, um, which I would say for a lot of people that is the worst case scenario, whether we're talking about climate or economic or other drivers, displacement is, is you know, and, and homelessness ultimately is, is what we're trying to avoid, keep people in homes. Um, but can we do it in a way that builds energy resilience, that protects power reliability and, and in, including power reliability for um, vulnerable populations, that doesn't leave low-income communities behind as stranded assets because they're still dependent on on natural gas infrastructure that may be transitioning or in general aging infrastructure? Um, and can we do it in a way that brings the labor force and, and supports labor at the same time? So we need to really be able to walk and chew gum here. Part of that is just understanding the context and starting even when we talk about interventions um, and programs for making improvements with understanding the underlying um, uh, stressors. Next slide. So I'm gonna cruise through these things really quickly, um, but I'll just keep them in the slides. I think I'm, I'm uh, about out of time, but it's really important that we understand these things are systemic um, and, and, and we have to balance that with paralysis versus, you know, you don't want paralysis by analysis, right? We know there are good things need, that need to be done right now, but we also are in real need of, of innovation. Um, understanding co-benefits, understanding um, how, these things can be designed to protect residents um, in multifamily homes. Next slide. And this can be uh, extrapolated across different kinds of, of mitigation or adaptation measures. So electrification is, is just one um, and decarbonization, that's a, a major piece of this. Um, but really we need to be thinking about how do we bring comprehensive, whether we're talking about flood or seismic or other interventions, um, bring them in context, develop programs that are relevant and actually meaningful to low-income housing, to rental housing, to multifamily housing, um, so that we can, can transition towards a resilient infrastructure, resilient housing stock, and resilient energy and, and infrastructure system. So thank you. Last slide. That's just me, and feel free to reach out. Um, this is, uh, these projects are an honor to work on, and, and I would love to talk about them more with anyone who uh, wants to geek out. Geeking out about resilience um, is uh, something that this panel is especially well equipped for, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. But first, I have to thank you, Heather, for a wonderful presentation, um, and really just for back-to-back -back awesome presentations. I'm looking forward to the discussion that we're um, about to kick off. Um, let me, before we get into the Q&A though, just remind people that if you have any questions, it's not too late, they are coming in, I appreciate that. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at EESI online. You can also send us an email, EESI at EESI.org. Um, and without further ado, let us transition to our moderated discussion. Um, 
the first question I have for the group, and Benjamin, we'll go back and we'll start with you and we'll go through your, the presentation order. Um, you spoke a Curious, um, what are the what are more what are the other data needs that are out there um, that we really need in order to advance our understanding of climate impacts? And I'm curious if those data needs vary by perhaps region or proximity to certain features. And one of someone asked us a question on Twitter. You know, what does all of this mean for people who might live near rivers um, versus coastal areas? So Benjamin, I'll turn it over to you. Um, for um, um, your thoughts on that. Um, thanks so much, Dan, and I really enjoyed everyone's presentations. Um, my, my sound so, cut out for oh. a couple of seconds for the first time in uh, the hour plus, uh, just as you were asking that question, but I think I got the important part, the second half. Um, so, uh, data needs, I'll actually start with the location and extent of affordable housing. In our research, we used this great compilation from the National Housing Trust on, on subsidized housing, but I know that that was already quite incomplete. Um, so I think as a starting place, a more and better resolved housing data uh, affordable housing data would be quite important. And when it comes to floods, you really need to know it at the down to the address level. Uh, um, we are very early uh, in our ability to be able to predict, track, and map inland floods with great skill. So I'll just, you know, I, I could go into lots of different things, and I want to leave it mostly for my um, co panelists. Um, a, a group called the First Street. Foundation just published, really, it was a coalition of scientists, uh, a model looking at you know, current and future inland flooding, which was very impressive, but it's just a start. Um, there's a lot of skill to be gained there, a lot of information to learn about flooding history uh, at different locations. So I would say inland flooding data and analysis is a really big one there, too. Great, thanks. And sorry, I know I cut out for a second, and it's too bad because I have never been more eloquent than I was in that two and a half seconds or whatever it was. And I'll never be able to recreate that, which is a bummer for the online audience. Lori, turn it over to you. What are the existing data, or what are some existing data gaps that still remain when it comes to evaluating coastal resilience and uh, resilience impacts on communities? And how does that change from your perspective across regions? That's a great question. I think that the existing the data that we need is looking at, uh, you know, easy to use future risk scenario um, that can be used with existing planning efforts. Um, not looking at just current floodplains, for example, but future floodplain mapping. I mean, the floodplain maps are critical because you know, that's what determines the uh, NFIP insurance rates. So. Um, New York City is looking at a future flood risk, uh, flood plague mapping scenario, and they've actually, uh, that's underway right now, but, and, and Miami has been looking at that, but I think we need some, you know, investment grade future flood risk uh, mapping tools. We also need some tools on rates of extreme precipitation, um, and that has not been, I have not seen that yet, because, you know, Harvey was a precipitation event. And the precipitation events, uh, Baton Rouge, uh, Baton Rouge's recent flooding uh, was precipitation related. So that's a critical need. I have not yet seen uh, a good tool. Maybe my colleagues, Anna and Heather have. Anna? Um, yeah, unfortunately, Lori, I don't have the, a good answer for you. I also think that that's a huge data need. I wanna second everything that you said. Um, Another thing that I'll bring up is uh, the fact that a lot of our understanding in this country of how floods affect people in terms of, say, damages to their homes comes from the National Flood Insurance Program. However, the vast majority of people in the U.S. don't have flood insurance. 
under the National Flood Insurance Program. They don't have flood insurance at all. And so when we're basing decisions on information that is from a program that not everyone is captured by, it means we're leaving out a huge amount of information um, that, that should be relevant to decision makers. And unsurprisingly, it's lower income people, people of color, people who live in disinvested communities who are less likely to have flood insurance in the first place. So if we're making policy decisions based on the past of the flood insurance program, we're not only not incorporating climate risk for the future, we are also basing our decisions on a subset of the population who doesn't represent the people who may be most at risk in the future. Um, there are, of course, like lots of um, commercial data sources where uh, people can go and pay a whole bunch of money. If you're a corporation, you know, you can go and look, or an insurance company, you can go and look up granular flood risk information that's, you know, modeled and predicted for certain circumstances. But if you're a small community or a member of the general public, you know, there's no way you're shelling out all that money for these um, fancy, fancy modeling predictions. So um, I think this comes back to the point I made in my presentation about better data transparency and accessibility just to the public at large. Um, I, That's a great point. I'd also like to add what Anna just said makes me think also we have to map the stability of our infrastructure as well, right? Because it's the grid that also determines the habitability of housing. So that has to come into play. Yep. Um, Heather, love to give you the last word on this question about um, data uh, data need gaps and sort of variability across regions or proximity to features. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, uh, I mean, I just echo what all of uh, my colleagues here have said, really um, all kinds of data gaps. Um, we don't even understand some basic things about affordable housing. Um, so really echoing uh, Benjamin's statement, we, we've been trying to do a market characterization of affordable housing in Los Angeles, and you'd think that'd be a straightforward exercise, and it's actually very difficult to correlate. We have all kinds of demographic data. We have some building data. It's very hard to correlate them in any kind of way, especially talking about naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, the other kind of data that I think we need to be thinking about and getting our arms around or how do you calculate co-benefits um, and social benefits and, and how do you go upstream? What are the methodologies and the data sources for doing that to inform policy? Um, that's not necessarily data that, that everybody wants to have their hands on all the time. Um, you know, it's pretty, um, you know, pretty dense um, kind of data sets and, and calculations, you know, Enterprise came to us and said, what is the business case for preservation of existing affordable housing and for funding retrofits? And uh, we have been working on that for, for some time and, and figuring out which, how far upstream do you go? What are the right methodologies? What are all the data sources? There's a lot of benefits, but they come from a lot of diffuse places. Um, and so it's really the, the methodology of linking these things. Um, so we hope to have a report out on that um, coming up but that's, that's a really critical piece too. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, next question I wanted to ask about was we, we actually covered a lot of really good examples of work being done in different parts of the country to begin to address um, sort of some of these impacts. Um, but Benjamin, I'd like to go back to you and um, maybe explore in a little bit more um, variety, um, other case studies, um, other good models that are out there examples of communities that are leading in these areas, small communities, large communities, perhaps communities with more or less resources than others, um, to give our audience maybe a, um, um, a better understanding of sort of the range of the work that's going on. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I very briefly, um, I also just want to respond to one thing I think Lori said in the mm -hmm. past round, which was about missing rainfall data. And um, that's true. There are only a handful of stations that are taking six minute scale rainfall data. And that's something that if it were expanded widely across the country would help us to learn um, a lot more about that urban kind of uh, precipitation driven flood risk. Um, I don't have a lot of uh, examples of local communities doing things one way or the other, but I 
want to um, just draw one contrast, which has come into focus for me through my sea level research, um, which is the contrast between Miami Beach and Atlantic City. Both of those, they are similar sized barrier islands facing similar threats. They're, they're both in quite bad shape in terms of sea level rise. And one of them, Miami Beach, is wealthy and investing, you know, already investing more than half a billion dollars of, uh, you know, in self assessed costs through bonds and taxes to raise their streets and put in pumps and do a whole range of mitigation measures. And it's, you know, sister city of Atlantic City is essentially bankrupt. And the only tiny investment that's happening is from the Army Corps of Engineers. And it's protecting you know, wealthier neighborhoods on the beach side because that process, as I understand it at the time it was implemented, the decision as to you know, where the Corps would invest was based on a benefit cost analysis. And in their analysis, therefore, you know, wealth, you know, high value property in wealthy neighborhoods like yielded a greater benefit per mile of levy or sand dune reinforcement. So meanwhile, on the other side, on the base side, and these, um, I, I began with the photograph of this um, working class, uh, poorer neighborhood, those homes have lost all their value. <laughs> if they weren't affordable housing before, they are now because they flood um, multiple times a year. Um, so and and the community just doesn't have the resources to invest. I think with problems like climate change and sea level rise that are striking so many communities at the same time, it's not going to be possible for state or federal governments to support each and every community financially with its resilience and adaptation efforts. And squeaky wheels and early movers are maybe more likely to get more resources and those often tend to be you know, wealthier and more powerful communities. So there, there really is a great impetus to you know, do the work we're talking about here, um, kind of shine a spotlight on the particular problem that uh, affordable housing and low-income communities are, are facing, um, because those are the communities that um, really are least likely to get but can stand to benefit the most from uh, federal and state resources. Thank you. Laura, I'd love to hear from you on this too. Um, you know, the, the affordable housing, I mean, there's been a conversation as of late about the issues around, um, and, and it's an ongoing conversation about the issues around retreating from coastline and um, communities being forced out of the floodplain. And that is true. There are a lot of reasons why communities are at great risk in the floodplain and in, in the coastal communities. The problem is, though, there's very little alternative and for folks to move to. Um, I was meeting with the New York City Mayor's Office of Resilience today, and you know, it's one thing to ask, to tell folks that they need to think about moving somewhere else because of the floodplain uh, risks. The problem is, is there's not a lot of places to move to. We have an affordable housing shortage in the country. So one of the things we should be considering in our planning efforts is looking at where are the receipts Communities. What are we going to do to support the communities that do have safe ground to make sure we plus up the affordable housing, to make sure we improve infrastructure, that when we're looking at investing in communities that we're looking at uh, receiving communities as well? Because, you know, I'll always remember the terrible um, pictures and videos, and I, it was down in uh, New Orleans after Katrina, uh, that we saw of, of households moving from New Orleans to Houston, and where did a lot of communities end up going? They went to shelter in a stadium. And then from there, you know, doubling up with, with, with uh, family and friends. I mean, it was really hard. So while we know this is a risk coming forward, let's start planning. The 10, 20 years out, we're gonna need to for the receiving communities. Thanks. And Anna, I'd love to hear from you too, and then to, um, from Heather about um, case studies or successful efforts that you see that are, um, you know, perhaps they're in progress, but are on the right track um, that are doing their best to improve community resilience. Yeah. So 
instead of a particular case in a in a particular location, I want to point to a sort of a policy method or an approach. Um, and this is something that my colleagues at NRDC and Enterprise are working on through uh, the Spark Initiative, which is the Strong, Prosperous, and Resilient Communities Challenge. Um, and uh, folks on that team and, and their partners have been looking into models of community ownership for land. Um, so things like land banks, community land trusts, and other methods of um, land ownership and maintenance and decision making that involves the community as opposed to just the government or private landowners. Um, and so this is a, a strategy that has been used successfully to preserve affordable housing in different places and also has been used to preserve land for conservation and open space. Um, and so I think there's really great uh, opportunities here to sort of bring those things together with climate change adaptation, looking at the intersection of affordable housing, um, open space, equitable access to green space, um, and making communities more adaptive to, to climate change. And so that's something that I'm really excited um, to be seeing sort of reports and, and research on, and, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about that as these um, methods get used more widely. Great, thanks for that. Heather? Uh, thanks. I was going to actually use a similar example of of the land trust, um, but I'll. I just want to give a quick shout out to um, a city, a little city. I think is doing some interesting things with a different process, um, and which is Olympia, Washington, um, mm -hmm. where they have really looked at how they allocate funds and how they do projects and bringing departments together on site to collaborate at the beginning of, of any kind of project they're going to do and really get all of these goals out there on the op in the open so that they have the engineering and the housing and the planning and the um and and, and all the groups understanding these these different pieces together before they go out and deploy a project and so i think part of it is you know there's there's a need for leadership uh, there's a need for new policy tools, and there's also a need for collaborative teams and different processes working together. Um, so um, I think they're doing a really interesting job. It's a nice model that that other cities, particularly cities of similar size and not the big, um, you know, sometimes it's actually harder for for the larger cities to to really be as collaborative. And um, you know, sometimes there's for smaller cities and communities, you can you can bring a team together to take a more collaborative approach. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, I think we may have lost Lori, so we're gonna do our best to get her back with us. Um, while we're doing that, I'd love to hear from the panel about, um, I guess I'll let you take the question in one of two directions, either emerging policy tools that you're aware of that are coming online that you're especially eager about um, that may be able to make a near-term positive difference in terms of how we address these issues, or, um, in lieu of that, if there is something that is not emerging yet, but that you would like to see emerge that you think would make maybe the most um, impact in the in the near to medium term, love to hear sort of what you see coming down the line or what you would like to see coming down the line. Benjamin, we can we can go back and start with you. Sure, I'll just uh, be very quick and do an advertisement that with um, collaboratives, we're working on an analysis trying to intersect toxic sites with flood risk and socioeconomic vulnerability, right? Because there's always the possibility of contaminants being spread by floodwaters. So that, that's an area of need that we see um, increasing as sea levels rise, um, but just one of uh, so many areas in need. And I'll, I'll pass it to the next panelist. Great. Um, and I think we'll skip over to you while we're getting Lori back online. All right. Um, uh, so one of the things that our team at NRDC does a fair amount of work on is something that um, Lori just brought up in her comments before, which is this idea of relocation and, dare I say, managed retreat um, from climate hazards that can't be addressed in place. Um, and we have done uh, uh, some research looking at um, existing programs for relocation assistance 
um, home buyouts, basically, um, in areas where residents are fed up with flooding in particular and just want to leave. Um, and this is, you know, perhaps the best and by best I mean worst example of how hazard mitigation funding doesn't serve communities well. There are so many issues with the programs and, and the funding mechanisms and, and the ways that um, they're just so challenging to implement and participate in. And so we're working on some policy ideas that would help make uh, the wait times for relocation assistance shorter help make multiple options available to residents who, um, so they're not just faced at the end of the day with the last worst choice of whether to stay or go, but can plan ahead to make decisions for the future. Um, and, and ways that help local governments also do sort of longer term land use planning for areas that may need to be relocated like Laura was talking about, where can people go so that they can stay close to home but aren't at risk anymore, um, or at least not as much. Um, so that's an area that it's hard to say that you're excited to talk about forced relocation due to climate change, but it is an area where there is, I think, um, such a, a growing um, interest and research, and there are a lot of really smart people who are working on this issue. So I think it's something um, that I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be to be a small part of and and contributing to some of this work. Thank you, um, Heather. Yeah, I think the thing that I would add would be um, one thing I'm I'm very excited and hopeful to see and hope will happen uh, is that federal grants um, can be streamlined and and directed in a way towards a holistic approach to resilience. Things like BRIC funding and CDBG and um, and other kinds of things that are that are quite complicated, and particularly, um, you know, I think for communities that don't have dedicated staff, that don't have, um, you know, pe a lot of experience with administering federal grants, um, better processes, streamlined programs, and more integrated approach um, to to getting funds from those programs out where they're needed before disaster strikes. So I would love to see, this is more of a wish list than, um, and a hope with the new administration coming in and, and some of the recommendations that we've seen floating around, um, but a hope that we can get money. Again, that's how to get that money to flow uphill, right? We need um, new um, processes and approaches, um, intergovernmental, interagency collaboration, better collaboration between HUD and FEMA, um, and some of these other agencies to, to think proactively before disaster happens, how to get money on the ground to implement some of these things um, in ways that create value for, um, for the community and, um, and you know, are, are that more holistic approach, that, that vision. So I think there's an opportunity to, to strip it down, to, to get the money out there, to get the money and get it out there to communities and, and help them um really uh implement some some important things on the ground thank you and you mentioned brick we haven't talked a whole lot about brick today um that's a new program the building resilient infrastructure and communities um from a few years ago congress um authorized it um that actually may be a good place to wrap today's briefing um benjamin or anna or heather i'm we're, we're not going to be able to explain brick in one to two minutes, but I'd love to give um, any combination of you um, sort of the last few moments of our briefing to say anything about perhaps what BRIC means to these efforts um, and, uh, and, and how that program is operating. I know it's, I think, about six months or so since the funding became available or thereabouts, but um, I'll leave it up to you for maybe a bit of a free-for-all. Any final words on BRIC? I think that's something that our policy audience might appreciate closing on. I defer. It's too bad Laura's not I, here because she would have the best answer. Yeah, I, do, I, can, I can speak to that. Laura may be the best person to talk to, but in her absence. Um, so BRIC essentially uh, is a hazard mitigation grant program um, that is operated by FEMA that's replacing um, a previous hazard mitigation program called the PDM or the Pre-Disaster Mitigation Program, which used to be an annual grant program that relied on appropriations from Congress to get the money um, and then make it available for grants. The exciting thing about BRIC is that um, the amount of money that goes into like the piggy bank of, 
of BRIC that can become available for grants is tied to disaster spending. So if there's a lot of disaster spending in a given year, and recently when isn't there, um, a certain percentage of that money spins off and becomes available for these hazard mitigation grants. And then there's going to be, to our understanding, an annual application process where local governments can go in and apply for that money. But it's gonna be, um, we think, a much more consistent source of funding, a larger source of funding than TDM ever was, and um, also something that is sort of more certain uh, as opposed to the sort of sporadic um, or uncertain funding from, from before. So um, yes, I, you can find out a lot about Brook on FEMA's website. They've recently published some really interesting information about the um, application pool of uh, projects that are coming in under the first round. So um, you can go check that out on their website. If I can well, jump in really yes, please do, Heather. Please 30 do. seconds. Uh, yes. We've been doing a bunch of interviews with, with different um, cities that we work with around what their experience with BRIC has been and, their, or, or, and, and with similar um, federal programs. And there's sort of a majority who are saying this is really complicated, it's really encumbered, and we just don't even know what to do with it. We're going to leave it on the table. Um, and a few others who are really being pretty proactive and figuring out how to get that money exactly where it needs to yeah. be. Um, I think the city of Houston is one that's doing some um, really with Marissa Ajo, their chief resilience officers, really thinking about how to get this, um, get those federal dollars, get them where they need to be and get them into low income communities for new approaches. So just a shout out to that effort. Um, and that's exactly what I'm saying of hoping for, for streamlined and more accessible way to deploy that doesn't just go um, to those who are, you know, really savvy. Thank you. That's a, a great note to end on. I really appreciate those comments. Um, we are about a minute almost to over, so apologies for that to our panelists um, for sticking with us right through the end. Unfortunately, we lost Lori. I think there may have been a power or internet outage that affected um, our connection. So um, I'm sure she was with us for at least the brick conversation or brick portion of our Q&A in spirit. Um, I know that program is near and dear to her heart. Thank you to Benjamin. Thank you to Lori, Anna, and Heather for being amazing panelists today and sharing your information and expertise with our audience. Uh, it was an excellent session. I learned so much about this issue. Thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone um, on Team EESI who um, is behind the scenes pulling all of this off. Uh, I'd like to thank Curtis who's helping us uh, on the tech side today. Um, also Dan O'Brien, Sydney O'Shaughnessy, uh, Amber Todoroff, Anna McGinn, Omri Laporte, and our five fabulous interns, Celine, Hamza, Jocelyn, Kimmy, and Rachel. Um, we had a great discussion today and we couldn't, we couldn't have had it without them. So thank to them, thanks to them very much. Um, let's go ahead, Curtis, and put the next slide up. Um, this is our survey slide. Um, it matters a great deal when our audience um, shares feedback with us. If you have two minutes, I encourage everyone to take the survey. We read every response. While you're taking that survey, I'm gonna take the opportunity to plug a couple things coming up from EESI. Um, next week is a big week in climate policy. Thursday is Earth Day. We're expecting big announcements um, out of the administration with uh, respect to the Paris Agreement. Um, and we are going big next week. We have two briefings. Um, the first is climate adaptation and resilience, the road to COP26. That's on Monday. Thanks to our co-sponsors, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP26, the British Embassy Washington, and the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. Um, that is going to be um, an awesome panel as well, and I hope everyone will have an opportunity to join us. And then on Tuesday, we're going to be rethinking, reduce, reuse, and recycle policies and programs to address waste. Um, thinking about plastics and recycling um, and the and, um, really incredible challenge that that um, problem presents us in terms of waste, but also in terms of emissions. Um, stay tuned. Also next week, we are going to be making an announcement about a, um, a quick turnaround briefing to analyze the um, contents of the NDC, which we expect to be released midweek next week. Um, and um, the fourth installment of Congressional Climate Camp, um, Adaptation Mitigation Double Whammies, is going to be Friday, April 30th. Um, and many of you have already RSVP'd for that, so thank you. I hope everyone enjoys it. We're going to be doing a bonus installment of Climate Camp in May specifically look at how budget reconciliation, that legislative vehicle could potentially be deployed 
uh, or leverage to advance climate solutions. Um, we're going to end it there. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks again to our four fabulous panelists and everyone in our audience today. Thanks to those who submitted questions. They really contributed a lot to our discussion. With that, we'll end and I hope everyone has a great weekend and hope to see you next week at um, the next DESI briefing, which is on Monday after or Monday morning at 11 Eastern. Thank you so much.